For almost 30 years, I've been helping people of all ages sleep better. It's a fun job for a physician because most patients will improve, but it's an odd occupation when we think about it because all of us have more experience sleeping than practically any other activity we do. You think by now we're all expert sleepers, but that's not the case. All of us know somebody doesn't sleep well. And there's some trolling statistics. On any given night, half of us don't think we slept well. About 30% of us have at least occasional insomnia. More than 10% of us have chronic insomnia. And it's estimated that worldwide, 1 billion people have obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, a condition characterized by snoring and sleep fragmentation, which can increase your risk of heart attacks, strokes, fall asleep at the wheel, and even cognitive decline. Over 80 distinct sleep disorders have been described. And unfortunately, as the population gets older, the prevalence of these is only expected to increase. Despite these troubling statistics, there's a lot of good news. Modern sleep science now has practical solutions to help most people sleep better. When I first meet a patient, there are four main areas about their sleep that I want to focus on. I want to ask them about the amount of sleep, the quality of their sleep, the timing of their sleep, and ultimately their state of mind. With regard to the amount of sleep, the National Sleep Foundation recommends that we get between uh, seven to nine hours of sleep every night. So if I meet somebody who tells me that they are sleepy or tired, but when they get more sleep, they feel better, then obviously you want to try to remove any barriers to help that person get that additional sleep. But what if you say that you are sleepy or tired no matter how much sleep you're getting? Then the problem is not the amount of sleep. Just like you can be both overweight and malnourished, you can sleep a lot but not be sleeping well. For example, if you snore, you may have obstructive sleep apnea, which has not been diagnosed or treated yet. And in that case, the more you're sleeping, the less you're breathing, and the more tired you're gonna feel when you wake up. You should not routinely wake up feeling tired. Sleeping's supposed to be refreshing. You don't leave your favorite restaurant feeling hungry. Why should you be getting out of bed feeling tired? It makes no sense. So if somebody tells me that they're tired or sleepy, no matter how much sleep they're getting, for me, that's a hard stop. You can measure your sleep uh, patterns over time with any one of several commercially available sleep trackers. You can get a home sleep study, which will measure your breathing patterns, your blood oxygen saturation, uh, your heart rate, and your sleeping position. You can have a more in-depth, detailed sleep study done in a sleep lab, which will measure your actual brain waves, your muscle activity, and your ventilation. The most common reason a person will have a sleep study is to look for obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea can kill you. When somebody dies in their sleep, sleep apnea may have been the culprit. When you have a sleep study, what we're gonna do is gonna measure your breathing and we look for disruptions of your breathing while you're sleeping. And we call these disruptions apneas and hypopneas. If you have more than five of these events per hour, you meet the minimum criteria to be diagnosed with sleep apnea. A hallmark of sleep apnea is snoring. Sleeping should be silent. You don't tip off your presence to predators when your guard is down. Why would you make noise when you're sleeping? All snoring is due to turbulent airflow in our throats. When you're breathing calmly awake, you don't make noise. Not all snoring is due to sleep apnea and not every sleep apnea will snore, but they often travel together. There are a lot of good treatment options for sleep apnea now, and even more options are in development. The most common treatment is a, a small air compressor called a CPAP machine. Patients sometimes um, say that they think they'll be unattractive to the bed partners if they use one of these devices. There's nothing sexy about your snoring. I sometimes joke that if somebody comes up with a dating app specifically for people who use CPAP, it would be very successful. So we spoke about the amount of sleep. We talked about the quality of the sleep. What about the timing? There's a whole separate category of sleep disorders related to sleep timing called circadian disorders. These are also very treatable. Ideally, you want somebody to have the same wake up time as close as possible on the work days as they do on the days off. And when you wake up, you want to get as much light as possible. Light helps your brain predict the future awakenings. An irregular wake up time will lead to an irregular falling asleep time. 
we want the homeostatic drive to sleep to synchronize with your core biological clock. And this helps create that predictable sleep-wake schedule that we're trying to get. The way to do this, the easiest way to do this, is to simply pick the earliest time you're motivated to keep and lock in that same wake-up time for several weeks. Initially, the body will reject it because it'll feel strange to do this. But after a few days, the body will start anticipating that wake-up time. The reason we anchor the wake-up time first is because it, the way the brain is wired, it's easier to push away sleep than to advance sleep. It's very hard to go to bed early. In fact, our brains are most alert about two hours before we fall asleep. So we spoke about the amount of sleep, quality of sleep, timing of sleep. What about the state of mind? It may be important to talk about how you feel about your time when you're awake, if I want to help you sleep better. What's your motivation to go to sleep? What's your motivation to get out of bed? Do you look forward to sleeping? Are you dreading tomorrow? Waking up is biological. Getting out of bed is volitional. I want you to understand that your life is reflected in your sleep and your sleep reflects your life. Sleep is a paradox. And the paradox is that we're vulnerable being attacked while we're sleeping. Sleep is as essential for our survival as food and oxygen. So you would think that the animals would have evolved the way of not sleeping, but that's not how it worked. Animals co-evolve ways to protect themselves while they're sleeping. And we're no exception. You just can't snap your fingers and go from fully awake to deeply asleep. Not gonna work. Patients often tell me that their problem is that they can't turn off their brain. But that's a fundamental misunderstanding of how sleep works. The brain is not meant to be turned off. In fact, the sleeping brain is very active. And one of the things the brain is doing is keeping us safe and ready to wake us up if anything dangerous is happening around us. So the brain is going to be in a vigilant mode whenever it perceives ourselves to be in danger and will sleep as lightly as possible. Long-term danger and chronic stress are similar to our brains. Anytime we're in a state of uncertainty, the brain is doing the right thing by either keeping us awake or having us sleep as lightly as possible. The opposite of being in a state of uncertainty is monotony. And this explains why sleep deprived people fall asleep easily when they're bored. You can learn to put aside your feelings of stress or anxiety at bedtime. And you can do this with any one of several mindfulness apps, yoga, meditation, cognitive behavioral techniques. They're all designed to help us be in a peaceful state of mind as we get ready for sleeping. Adults, like children, sleep best in states of serenity. You will need to create your bedroom to be a sanctuary for yourself. To sleep better, I want you to think of sleep in a new way. The need for food is biological. What we eat is cultural. The need for sleep is biological, but the way we sleep is learned. So there's a learned component to sleeping, and it's easy to prove. All of you have bed partners. You know that each one of you has your own side of the bed, right? Every night you have a conversation about which side you're gonna use that night? No. When you travel as a couple, when you get to your destination, you each put your belongings on the side of the bed that you know you're gonna be sleeping in. There's really nothing to discuss. Switch sides and see how you feel. And if you sleep alone, rotate your body in your bed, put your feet where your pillow normally goes and see how you feel that night. Same bed, same bedroom, same everything. You may even fall out of bed if you do that. So there's a learned component to sleeping which also means you can learn to sleep differently. What I want everyone to hear is this, sleeping is the most powerful and natural form of self-care that we have. Mild sleep disorders is how severe sleep disorders start. And these are progressive conditions and they also run in families. So there's some things you can do to help yourself sleep better. First, get between seven to nine hours of sleep every night. Do not obsess over the number. You can get a sleep tracker if you like tech. Two, avoid working right up until the time you fall asleep. You're not a machine. You have to create that sanctuary for yourself. Insomnia was around long before we've had the internet or cell phones. A good book can also keep us awake. So it's not likely the screens are the main reason you're not sleeping. They may not be helping, but the content of the information you're receiving is more likely to keep you awake than the actual light source. 
If you're dreading going to sleep, that's a clear sign that you should be seeking professional help. Three, if you have trouble falling asleep or having trouble staying asleep, stop trying to sleep, okay? What you're doing is forcing yourself to keep yourself awake. Sleep will always come. So if you find yourself being frustrated, tossing and turning, get up, leave the bedroom and do something that's of no personal value. Go read the refrigerator warranty. But if you get up and do something productive or entertaining, you're just rewarding the insomnia. Another thing for those of you who have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, lock in your wake up time first. All of us have several brief awakenings during the night. None of us really sleep the entire night through. It just feels that way because we don't remember these brief awakenings. For many of us, the only time we're ever alone with our thoughts is when we're in bed. If you find that you have racing thoughts keeping you awake, schedule some time in the evening away from your bed to be alone with your thoughts. Six, if somebody tells you you snore, believe them. They may be saving your life. Finally, if you're waking up tired and sleepy, no matter how much sleep you're getting, talk to your doctor and ask about getting a sleep test. I have seen thousands of patients over the years and most of them get better. When somebody with a chronic sleep disorder gets better and it can happen fast, it's amazing to see the vitality return. I never get tired of seeing it. So I wish you all a good night of sleep tonight and every night. Thank you for listening.